A lot of you will be familiar with this strange identity here 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot 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 is equal to minus 1 twelfths. Now when you think about it this looks totally insane because what we're doing here on the left side is we're adding larger and larger positive values, infinitely many of them. So if anything this left side should add up to plus infinity and not to negative one twelfths. For most people who look at this for the first time and think that well, this is just nonsense. Um, well except it comes up in a very very famous letter in mathematics a letter that was written by this guy down there, Srinivasa Ramanujan, in 1913, was addressed to G. H. Hardy in Cambridge, in the UK, one of the most famous mathematicians at the time. Now, a lot of people have heard about this letter, but have not seen it. So I thought I'll show it to you. Okay? So here's the letter. It's a long letter, and it's basically lots and lots and lots of theorems, mathematical theorems. It's an enumeration of lots of theorems that Ramanujan says he's, he's found. And the most remarkable thing about this is that he has no real formal mathematical training, unlike Hardy. And so a lot of these things are pretty amazing. And towards the end of the letter, well, this strange identity here comes up and a couple of similarly strange identities around it. And actually this letter got an invitation to, to England to work with Hardy. So, you know, maybe we should have a really, really close look at this. And that's actually what I want to do today. Now, I'm not the first one to do this. Numberphile has done a couple of videos on this and other people. Um, but I think I'd like to really try to do this properly. So it's going to be a very long video. And so to make this accessible to as many people as possible, I've split it into four parts. So four levels of enlightenment. And you can pretty much stop anywhere and you know get something out of it this way. So let me know how far you get with this video. Since Ramanujan was a devout Hindu, I thought I'll ask the elephant god to help us out here to lead us through these four different levels of enlightenment when it comes to these strange sums. Okay, here's level one. Just do it. Now Ramanujan actually doesn't tell how he derives this strange value in his letter to Hardy. It's just, you know, it's just there. He just says, that's what I get. Now we have his notebooks and there is a, one of the pages from the notebook where he actually talks about this. On the previous page he also talks about it. This is more like an afterthought to what he did on the other page. But this one I can actually do in a video like this. So I'll keep it completely elementary. I can do this one here. So let's have a close look at what he does. Okay, so he starts by saying C and he doesn't call it a sum, he says it's a constant, um, c is equal to this strange sum. And then he does a couple of you know, logic, logical deductions and at the end of that he gets to minus 112. It's not much, so we should be able to do this, right? Okay, so here we go. So he says there's something there, that something, I call it c, so c is equal to the sum. Now, if that something is halfway as reasonable, I should be able to manipulate this as usual. So one of the things I should be able to do is multiply it by 4. So he does that. So 4 times c is uh, equal to 4 times 1 is 4. I put the 4 under the 1. No, I put it under the 2. Whatever. Let's just go with it. Then 4 times 2 is 8. Again, I skip 1, put the 8. And then I always skip 1 and put down all the multiples of 4 here in the second line. And now the next step is to subtract the bottom from the top. We get c minus 4c is minus 3. 1 minus 0 is 1. 2 minus 4 is minus 2. 3 minus 0 is 3. 4 minus 8 is minus 4 and so on. So we get this nice sum here. 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus etc. Okay, now comes something surprising. Now, Ramanujan somehow sees that this is equal to, well, 1 divided by 1 plus 1 squared. Well, 1 plus 1 squared, that's 1 fourth. So if that somehow makes sense, well, then we can say uh, minus 3c is equal to 1 fourth. Just solve for c, we get minus 1 twelfths. Okay, now we still need that step here. I mean, that's not clear at all, right? That's not clear at all. So how do we get that? That actually has two ingredients. The first ingredient is that Ramanujan knows that 
uh, the 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus etc. sum is equal to the 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus etc. sum squared. Okay. Second ingredient is this here, that the 1 minus 1 plus 1 etc. sum is equal to 1 divided by 1 plus 1. Okay, so let's just try to make sense of this. First one. So here we've got an infinite sum that's multiplied by itself. So how do we do this? Well, we have to multiply every term at the top by every term at the bottom and then add up everything. So let's just arrange it like this. So this is the first sum here. That's the second sum here. Now we do uh, first term times first term. That's one times one is one. Now first term times second term is minus one. First term times third term is one and so on. And that actually gives us this nice checkerboard pattern of plus and minus ones. How do you sum up this checkerboard pattern here? Uh, well, you do it in diagonals. So here we go. We've kind of put in diagonals. And now uh, what's the sum that we're actually forming here? Well, blue diagonal is one. Green diagonal is minus two. Yellow diagonal is plus three. Next diagonal is minus four and so on. So this uh, then clarifies what, what he means by this. What about the second step? That the one minus one plus one, etc. sum uh, is equal to one divided by one plus one. Well, that comes from something that a lot of you will be familiar with, uh, this identity here, the sum of the geometric series. Now, this is not valid for all R, uh, it's only valid if the r is kind of small, right? So if it's in the range from minus 1 to plus 1, this actually works. So for example, if we choose r is equal to uh, 1 half, then this whole thing turns into 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth, and so on is equal to 2. So, you know, a lot of people will have seen this, a lot of people will be familiar with this. As I said, this works in the range from minus 1 to 1. It doesn't work for minus 1, it doesn't work for 1, at least not in standard calculus. But what Ramanujan now does, and a couple of people before him actually, is substitute r equal minus 1 anyway. And when you do that, what do you get? Well, uh, here you get minus 1, here you get 1, here you get minus 1, and so on. So that gives you this identity. And then, of course, if you substitute this into that, you get exactly what Ramanujan wants. Okay, now if you know any calculus, you think like every single step here is totally insane. So there's these sums here, right? This one here, that one here, that one here. Um, we're subtracting infinity from infinity. So nothing here makes sense. So I've got my insanometer here at the left. So let's give this a score of four on the insanometer. Well, insane, yes, but remember, this guy here is a genius. And this guy here, G.H. Hardy, well, he's, he's not a dummy either. So somehow they, they kind of take these things seriously. So we better have a close look. Okay, so what does uh, Ramanujan do here? Well, he actually does something that's, that a lot of mathematicians do when they don't know what to do. So often, you know, you're encountering expressions like this. So somebody just kind of scribbled down on a piece of paper something with lots of dots in it. And to start with, that's just a couple of symbols on a piece of paper, and you don't really know what, what they mean. Right? So they don't really know what they mean. You know, if there's just finitely many without the dots, you usually know what it means. But if there's a dots in there, you know, it gets tricky. So you don't know what this means, right? Um, now, you can try and kind of just straight away develop some theory that makes sense of these sorts of things, but often it's a better idea to just kind of do it, okay? So what you do is, you don't know what, what these things are, so you just let them be some sort of unknown value. And then you just kind of go for it. So if they're anything reasonable, you should be doing the sort of manipulations that maybe are not too wild, um, you know, and, and then maybe it gets you somewhere. And now let me just demonstrate this. Uh, this is a kind of a very famous one. So you've got this infinite sum. This was actually a geometric series that we just looked at. And what can I do here? Well, uh, if that's anything reasonable, I should be able to multiply it. Just like what Ramanujan does at the beginning, he multiplies by 4, I multiply by r. Okay, so I multiply 
r times c. Then on the other side we get 1 times r, I put the r here, then r times r, r squared, I put it there, uh, and so on. And that will give me this. And then I do exactly what Ramanujan does. I subtract uh, the bottom from the top. So c minus rc, there we go. And then here, well, here we're really lucky, a lot luckier than, than Ramanujan with his sum. Everything here pretty much cancels out. And the only thing that's left over is the one. And then we can solve for c. We get this. Okay. And so what we've found here is that assuming that this somehow makes sense and that we can manipulate it as usual, uh, necessarily get that this has to be equal to 1 over 1 minus r. And now later on in calculus, when you actually really go for it, you actually say, well, this does make sense when r is in this range, but only then. Yeah? So for other values of r, like minus 1, you know, that one here, that doesn't make sense. That gets discarded, that's evil. We don't want to know this. We don't touch this in standard calculus. But actually it turns out that you know, if, you, if you just set up mathematics in a slightly different way, this might actually make total sense. So on a different planet, that might be totally okay. Now you could also try r equal to 2, for example, in here, and then you get something really strange, which is very close to um, the sum that we actually started with. So it's 1 plus 2 plus 2 squared plus 2 cubed. That's all positive values getting bigger and bigger. Should add up to infinity, but this guy here says it's actually minus 1. So how does that work? Right? Well, it turns out if you're just on the right sort of planet, uh, there is mathematics that makes perfect sense in which this is actually true. Okay, and now that was level one. So did you survive so far? Perfect. Now if you want to actually know how we make sense of all these things, just stick around for level two. Okay, so in level two, we're actually going to focus uh, not so much on what happens on other planets, but what happens on Earth, okay? So level two is about following the rules. What are the rules for dealing with these sorts of things in, in standard calculus? What makes this right and all of these wrong? Well, the short answer is that this guy here on the left, which is called an infinite series, um, is convergent and has some too, whereas all of those guys here are divergent. Okay, let's have a close look. Now, at some point in time, somebody wrote down this infinite sum. And at that point in time, actually, nobody knew what that really means. Um, well, you know what one plus one half is, you know what one plus one half plus one fourth is, but what does it mean to add up infinitely many things? I mean, to start with, there, you know, there's no, doesn't have any meaning. All right, but, we can try to give it some meaning. So we'll just start adding, okay? So we've got one, note it down. We add one half to one, we get three halves. And then we add one fourth to get seven fourths. And we just keep going, going like this. And we get a sequence of numbers down here and that goes on forever. Um, and when we have a close look at this sequence of numbers, the sequence of partial sums, then we see, well, they get closer and closer to two. And actually, 2 is, is greater than all of them. And in fact, 2 is the smallest number greater than all of these, these values, all of these partial sums. Okay, and if you look at this expression, well, if it's to mean anything, I mean, the, really, the most natural thing to say here is that this should be equal to 2. And actually, it's a definition. It's a, you know, a definition that mathematicians have made. It's our choice to say that you know, this sum here is equal to 2. It's a definition. It's a very natural one. It's, you know, probably the most natural one, but it's still a choice, our choice, to do it this way and not another way. Um, in fact, there's another human choice in there that other human choices always kind of in the background whenever you deal with these sorts of things is that we're actually always, by default, talking about real numbers. Okay, so we're talking about real numbers. That's how we make sense of things. Um, there would be other possible choices for the default number system that we use. And on different planets, maybe they use something different. For example, the surreal numbers or the hyperreal numbers. But for everything that we do here on Earth, as a default, it's surreal numbers. Also important to keep in mind. 
Now, why was our choice of definition so good? Well, because to a large extent you can actually manipulate these, these sums just like you would manipulate um, finite sums. You know, that's, you know, sometimes not, but uh, for example, if you've got a convergent series here and the sum is A, then you can actually multiply the right side here by something, for example, 5, and you get something convergent again. The series that we get down here is convergent again, and it converges to has the sum 5a as expected. So that's really good. Or if you've got two of those guys, right? So infinite series, sum a, infinite series, sum b, we can termwise add things, and that gives us another infinite series that converges, and the sum is a plus b. Perfect. Or we can subtract the bottom from the top, and that will give us the right thing a minus b. Perfect. So what that means in particular is that if this guy here is a convergent sum, then all of these manipulations that we did here are perfectly okay. And we get the right result. Right? So we multiply, we subtract, that's, uh, that works again, and we get the right result. Now, in standard calculus uh, courses, you actually usually don't get to this point. There's actually some bits about our definition that are not so great. So for example, if you've got something that works, convergent, convergent, and you multiply them together, you would expect that you always get uh, like a times b, something convergent with, with the sum a times b, and often that is the case, uh, but sometimes it actually isn't. So for example, this guy in here that's convergent has a sum, but when you actually do the, the square of this, this, this sum by itself, um, that doesn't converge, and it's a bit of a problem. But let's keep this in mind. Okay, so this is maths on Earth. So let's just have a look at these sums here. Why don't they work? Well, let's have a look at the first one here. Partial sums, we need partial sums. So first partial sum is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, plus 1 is 1, minus 1 is 0, and so on. So 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. That doesn't converge to anything that doesn't have a limit. So it's, you know, it doesn't have a sum in the normal, usual sense. So that means it's divergent. What about the second one? 1, 1 minus 2 is minus 1, plus 3 is 2, minus 4 is minus 2, and so on. Also doesn't settle down. Forget about it. Last one, 1, 3, 6, 10 kind of explodes. All these series here on the left side are divergent. They don't have a sum. Definitely no one half here, definitely no one fourth here, definitely not one minus one twelfth there. Hmm. But when you kind of look at it, these sequences that we get here, the sequences of partial sums, you know, they're very different. So in standard calculus, you kind of just take everything that's not convergent and just say, well, throw it away. So you don't really look at the difference that you get here. There's a you know, graduation. There's actually different sorts of divergence here. So different sorts of divergence. And this one is kind of a tame one. This is, well, it's still kind of uh, oscillating around a common center here somehow, and this kind of explodes. Um, you know, maybe you want to capture the differences between these different sorts of uh, divergence. So let's have a look at the first one here. So it's a very, very famous one, actually. The first thing that you see in calculus is pretty much saying that, you know, this doesn't work, you know, for various reasons. Now, partial sums, 1, 0, 1, 0. This is supposed to be equal to 1 half. Well, how do you get 1 half out of 1 and 0? Well, somehow do the average, right? So the average of 1 and 0 is 1 half. And actually, there's a, there's a very neat way of defining the sum of one of these series in a different way. So what we do is, we don't stop with the sequence of partial sums, but now what we do is we generate a second sequence of averages. So average of 1 is, well, 1. Average of 1 and 0 is 1 half. Average of 1, 0 and 1 is 2 thirds. And then 1 half again, and it keeps on going like this. So we have another sequence of numbers here. And actually, when you look at that one here, well, every second one is a one-half. And then the red ones here, they also converge to one-half. They have a limit of one-half. So overall, the sequence that we're generating here has a, has a limit that is one-half. So in terms of the second sequence, what we get is convergence. And, and it makes sense to say that, in some ways, 
this series here does converge to one half. And there's actually a special, special name for this. Um, the sum is Cesaro convergent, if that sort of thing happens. Right? So if you've got a series, you first do the sequence of partial sums, and then you do the sequence of averages. If the sequence of averages converges to a number, then this number is called the Cesaro sum of the series that we're looking at. So the series is Cesaro convergent. And actually this different sort of convergence, this different sort of uh, attaching a sum to a series um, makes a lot of sense and really on a different planet, with a different sort of civilizations, they may actually have chosen this as their default definition of sum of a, of a series. Could well be. Um, this sort of thing actually has just as nice properties as everything else. So for example, if a series converges in the standard way, then it will also uh, be Cesaro convergent. So that's really good. But obviously what we've seen here is that there's certain series that this guy here can sum that uh, normal, you know, normal people can't, can't sum. Um, also, this sort of thing works. Right? So if you've got something that Cesaro sums to A, then five times that is that one in terms of Cesaro. And the adding business works, the subtracting business works. And so what that means again is that you go back to the very beginning. If in your version of mathematics you are uh, talking about Cesaro sums, whenever you're talking about something like this, then this calculation here will actually give you the right answer. And it does, right? It, it gives us the answer uh, one half for one minus one plus one and so on. Further in calculus, you actually learn about these things. Um, they are actually very useful. So they not only make sense, but also very useful even for the stuff that you know, we define as making sense. So for example, before I told you that when you've got something that has a sum A, and there we've got another one then B, so in the standard way, in the standard way, then the product not necessarily um, will converge. The product sometimes diverges. But when you add the product in the Cesaro way, you will actually always get what you expect A times B. So actually adding in the Cesaro way uh, gets rid of one of those not so nice things about the usual uh, definition of, of sums. And there's other things that uh, Cesaro summation takes care of. Um, so there's something called Fayer's theorem, which is about All right, so now let's have a look at our incenometer. Well, on planet Cesaro, if Ramanujan writes a letter, he will actually only get an insanity score of three instead of an insanity score of four uh, that we had before. Okay, now let's have a look at the next sum here on our list. That was the one minus two plus three and so on sum. If we look at the partial sums, we get one minus one, two and so on. So that doesn't work. Now let's just do the Cesaro thing, so the averaging. When we do the averaging, we get these guys here. And you see, well, that doesn't work, right? That doesn't converge. So we've got every second one is a zero. These guys here, the red ones, they converge to, they have a limit of one half. Okay, so if you actually step back here, step back and, and look at the sequence of partial sums, you see like every second one is a zero, and then eventually the red ones will be indistinguishable from one half. Okay, well, okay, so there's one fourth that we had before. What does have zero and one half to do with one fourth? Well, it's the, it's the average, right? It's the average. So we can actually kind of repeat our game. So we'll just do the averages of the averages now. So we do, you know, we put down one and then we do the average of those two and then the average of those two and the average of those four. So it gives us another sequence of numbers and that will actually converge to one fourth. Um, I'm not going to write down the numbers now, but it's, it's going to work. And we can actually now choose this higher order Cesaro thingo to mean our sum, right? So on a different planet again, you know, so on a different planet, maybe on the planet of the uh, blue aliens, people define sums of, of series in terms of this 
well, first, second, third sequence of numbers that's associated with any series. Could do that. And in a planet like this, well, the insanometer here would show just a, a, a reading of two. Right? So we're on a planet like this, you know, that, that gets more and more reasonable what, what uh, Ramanujan does there. And we can actually keep on going playing this game. So we had like the first sequence, that's us. Second sequence, that was my green alien friend who prefers this sort of summation. Then the blue alien friend who prefers the next one down. But then of course we can do more and more kind of averages. So the next one would be the average of the average of the average, another sequence. And these methods get more and more powerful. So you kind of go up and up and up and up and up. And you can sum more and more a series. But what about this guy here? Will we ever be able to get to minus 112s? Well, if you think about it, uh, no, right? So we've got positive numbers here. We do partial sums, that's going to be positive numbers again. Average of positive numbers, again, positive numbers. Now, whatever you do here, you'll never get anything that will get into the minuses. All right, for our super sum, I have to tell you a little bit about functions. Okay, so here we've got x squared graphed over the positives. Now we can extend this nice smooth function into the negatives in infinitely many ways. And I've just drawn like three of them. So there's, we can extend it as x squared, but also in many, many other ways, in a smooth way across zero here. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Now, so far I've been talking about the real numbers and the real numbers are usually represented by the a real number line. Now I also have to talk about the complex numbers, which is usually represented by the complex plane. So here, there's a com some complex numbers. If you've never heard of complex numbers, check out some of these videos here before you watch the rest. Now everything I've said about uh, standard summing of series, Cesaro sums, average of averages sums, stays true if you're actually considering series of complex numbers. You can also have functions, complex functions, defined on various bits of the complex plane. And some of them are actually super duper nice, smooth. They're called analytic functions. Okay, so if you've got, for example, a function uh, defined on the right part here of the complex plane, everything to the right of the imaginary axis, how many different ways are there to extend this to the left here, to the left part of the complex plane? Now, these analytic functions are actually really, really, really nice, a lot nicer than real valid functions. So if actually this continuation exists, then it's uniquely determined. So it's something very, very special. Um, and it's called the analytic continuation of our analytic function. So these things are super duper nice. Okay, let's have a look at one of those things. So here is an infinite series. It depends on a variable z, so that z can be any complex number. Right? Now we can check for which complex numbers does this thing converge, say in the standard way. In the standard way, it converges everywhere here in the yellow. So for example, at 1, z equals 1, if we substitute here, we get this series. And we've already seen this before in the Apple Paradox video. Uh, that sums to log 2. All right. Now, since you've watched this video, you probably come up with an idea straight away. What if we don't sum in the standard way, but if we sum like the Cesaro way? And actually something really, really nice happens. You get part of the analytic continuation defined like this. So if you sum Cesaro, you get everything here to the right, which is really nice. Among other things, you can figure out what's the value of the analytic continuation here at, at zero. And what do you get? Well, at zero, we have, well, that's everywhere, one, 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 one. So we get one minus one, and we know what the Cesaro sum of that is. That's one half. Okay, and then what, what about averages of averages? Well, that gets us everything up to here. So let's just plug in minus one here, so minus one. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that sum. And so that tells us that the analytic continuation here is actually equal to one fourth. And then we do averages of averages of averages, and we get 
this guy there. And we keep on going like this. And actually, kind of nice homework assignment, what do these question marks stand for? A bit hard. <laughs> All right. So these things are actually useful, you know, for uh, you know, defining the analytic continuation of this very important Dirichlet function. Now we'll change all the minuses to pluses. That's the Riemann zeta function. So the holy grail in mathematics, uh, the Riemann hypothesis is all about this guy here. So it's very important to know what it is. Now the series, uh, just with a standard summation, uh, defines an analytic function here to the right again of the purple line. So what does Cesaro give us? What does averages of averages give us? What do all of the other things give us? Do they give us the analytic continuation of this thing? Well, sadly, not really. So you don't really get anywhere with this. But there is an analytic continuation here. And let's just see what we get here formally if we substitute minus one. So if we do minus one, we actually get our Ramanujan sum, the super sum, okay? Okay, so what are we thinking now? Well, to start with, when we defined these generalized sums, we took the first thing that came to mind here. But what if there's different ways of generalizing the standard way of summing series? Other ones, right? A um, bit more sophisticated ones. Maybe those will allow us to calculate the analytic continuation of, of this sum up there. And they actually are. They are more complicated ones. For example, Ramanujan uh, invented one. And then, well, since, since there are such sums, um, maybe it's possible to then calculate these sums using Ramanujan's manipulation. And it's actually true. The analytic continuation at minus 1 is minus 1 twelfths. Now here's something very, very, very important. Those first couple of summation methods that I talked about, they conceivably could really be replacements of the standard way of summing things on some planet. Now, these more complicated summation methods, like uh, Ramanujan's one, when you look at it, it's got integrals in it, and it's got like sums in it and special numbers. They only work in special contexts. They work for special sorts of series. They're really, really useful there, but they could never, ever replace standard summation. If at any point in time you get on your calculus test, what is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, etc., and you answer, minus 1 over 12, almost certainly you will get <laughs> zero marks. Whenever you get something like this, there's a standard way of interpreting a sum like this, and the standard way involves, you know, the partial sums. Do the partial sums converge or not over the reals? That's what's being asked here, nothing else, okay? If you give any other answer, it will be wrong, okay? Just keep that in mind. So the last thing I want to talk about is, um, again, the geometric series, because most of you will be familiar with this. And most of you have been told, you know, to disregard anything outside, you know, small values of, of z. Now, this one actually works for, for complex numbers too, and it defines a nice analytic function here in the unit circle. If you actually now sum using Cesaro, it will also give you things on the unit circle. So it will actually give you the analytic continuation on the unit circle. What else? Well, if you do uh, averages of averages, it actually doesn't get you any more. But there's an analytic continuation, of course, of this function that's defined here. And this analytic continuation is actually this sum here that we calculated before. So again, I mean, what comes out of there is not nonsense. It defines something. It defines values of the analytic continuation of the function that's defined by this guy here. Uh, but that's what it is.